So welcome everyone to Southern Divers. And this morning we've got Aaron talking to us from the, um, talking about the Bikini Atoll and truck. Um, he's from Dirty Dozen Expeditions. Um, and he's gonna go into more detail about how we can dive in these places and what diving there is there and um, the amazing diving that is there. And I know we've got some, some people that are based out in that area and they're on the ships there as well. So um, it'd be great to hear from those guys as well, but I'm gonna hand over to Aaron now, thank you. Okay, nice one. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, my, like, like you said, my name is uh, Aaron Ankrumsen and uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, Truck Lagoon and Bikini Atoll. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background of uh, myself and the Dirty Dozen Expeditions. So uh, this is an expedition company I founded in 2017. Um, and that's kind of where I've been operating in, in Truck Lagoon since 2017. I used to uh, live on the boat there in Micronesia for uh, about a year and a half. I was working with uh, Craig as well, as it's in the chat, as you maybe noticed. Um, but uh, when I came back from uh, living in Mic uh, Micronesia for a year and a half, uh, before that, you know, I'd owned technical diving school operations, um, you know, been in the industry for around 15 years. So I saw a huge opportunity uh, to bring something special uh, to truck and bikini. Um, and that was all about doing these kind of bespoke uh, itineraries to both destinations. So the way we kind of approach it is we have um, special guests. So if you have, you know, Jill Heinerth, um, or Mark Powell, uh, Richard Longgren, you know, any of these kind of uh, juggernauts in the diving industry, uh, we would invite them to be special guests on their trips, on our trips. Um, and then we'd, we'd run a custom itinerary where like 75% um, of the boat's capacity is, is only taken. So there's plenty of space for the techies. Um, and we run a custom uh, wreck uh, trip. So you know, the, the wrecks that we choose in, in truck, for example, are very uh, focused on the clientele that we have. And this is just, this was all based on me and the skipper uh, and Craig, you know, uh, having a beer and talking about our ultimate uh, uh, charter if, uh, if we were running it. And now we are. So um, the, the point of this presentation, like I said, Truck Lagoon and Bikini Atoll, um, how are they different and what are they all about? Because I can imagine uh, most of you have uh, read uh, and watched documentaries about uh, both destinations. Um, but if you're not like really well versed in both of them, you would think they would be fairly similar, but uh, nothing could be closer uh, or further away from the truth on that part. They're actually uh, almost uh, black and white. And that's kind of uh, what we're gonna cover. So I'm going to start by sharing the screen and uh, then we get started. Let's see. Share, optimize video clip, bam. And then... All right, so we're going to start with um, Truck Lagoon and the topics we're going to be covering uh, their history, so Operation Hailstone in Truck Lagoon and Operation Crossroads in Bikini Atoll. How are they different? We're going to talk about the shipwrecks, so what type of wrecks can you find in each destination? Uh, we're going to be talking about the diving depth, so what is the average depth in Truck Lagoon and, and the skill levels needed? You know, do you need, can you do it as, a, as an open water diver? Can you do it as a advanced trimix diver, like what, what, what's the certification needed in each destination? We're gonna talk about uh, cost, so how you plan uh, to do such a big trip. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been a dive bum my entire life. So going on expensive liverboards is not just something I can, I can do quite easily. Um, so that's something we took into consideration in, when we created our business as well. We have you know, dates like four years in advance and we do these kind of installments for people. So we make it affordable for, for everybody. Um, we're gonna talk about the travel time. So difference in travel to each uh, of these destinations because it's actually quite, quite vast. Um, so here's uh, just a picture I really enjoy. We took it 
last year on the most uh, famous uh, wreck in Truck Lagoon called the Fujikawa Maru. Um, I could sit down now and talk to you about Operation Hailstone for hours. And so can Craig, that's in this chat. Uh, we're such uh, geeks, you know, that's kind of how the, the typical diver that goes to truck, um, they are huge history geeks, you know. Uh, it's it's about a lot more than just diving when you when you go to truck. Uh, but what one thing I found in these presentations is uh, there is a documentary that Jacques Cousteau filmed. Uh, it's called The Lagoon of Lost Ships, and that one is featuring truck. And he has a little slide about Operation um, Hailstone in truck. So I actually have that clip with me, and I believe he will explain it a lot better in a lot shorter amount of time with some cool pictures and, and audio. So I'm just going to skip to that right now. And uh, that's going to cover Operation Hailstone in Truck Lagoon. So how how did the biggest concentration of war wrecks get created? Truck, a tropical atoll on the eastern tip of the Caroline Islands. It's Lagoon a burial ground for a vast fleet of ships. Entering the sheltered bay, Philippe Cousteau and his team from Calypso are confronted by a ghostly display. Oxidized mementos of war. Now symbols of waste. Tragic testimony that a battle was fought here. The rusted residue of trucks' violent past. During World War II, Truck was home base for the combined fleet of the Japanese Imperial Navy. From the beginning of the war, its buildup was fast and efficient. Truck was the center of Japan's defense perimeter, not only the main staging area for its fleet, but also an important air base. It was called the Gibraltar of the Pacific, and it was considered the strongest naval base in this part of the world since Pearl Harbor. Most of the fortifications were built for defense against a landing from the sea, but the Allied decision was to neutralize Truk by a concentrated air attack. On the morning of February 16, 1944, the first strike. 70 American fighter planes. Initial objective, the airfields. Hundred and seventy five aircraft are destroyed before they can take off. Japanese air defense is quickly paralyzed. Next, the main targets, the ships anchored in Truck Lagoon. The Japanese command has ordered its warships to safer waters. Delayed by bad weather and trapped at anchor are more than 30 vessels, the pride of Japan's auxiliary fleet. two days, the lagoon is transformed from a naval fortress to a ship's graveyard. So there we go. That was kind of a short recap uh, of what happened in Operation Hailstone during uh, World War II. So um, if we kind of look at, I mean, it's often said, you know, when you when you look at Operation Hailstone, it's kind of the revenge of Pearl Harbor. So so uh, if we look at this in numbers, what happened? We have Task Force 58 coming in, 
uh, with their aircraft carriers and battleships and destroyers. And they had 500 airplanes uh, when Operation Hailstone was uh, conducted uh, over a 48 hour attack. Now, during this attack, they destroyed 50 plus uh, vessels in the lagoon and 250 airplanes. Now, what's notable about the vessels that are in uh, Truck Lagoon is the vast majority of them uh, are merchant vessels because uh, for the most part, uh, this was a refueling station. It was a repair anchorage. Uh, there was a substantial amount of Navy vessels there also, uh, but the Admiral there got tipped, uh, tipped off uh, right before Operation Hailstone happened. And he was able to take out some of the bigger Navy vessels out of the lagoon before the attack actually happened. So assuming, let's just say there are exactly 50 vessels, uh, merchant vessel, uh, vessels in truck, nine out of 10 on average uh, are merchant vessels. And then that one out of 10 is kind of Navy vessels, a submarine, a destroyer, et cetera. So that's a huge uh, contrast to remember compared to Bikini Atoll, which we'll speak about later. Uh, this slide, uh, it's an excellent uh, a drone photo that uh, our skipper Martin Critch uh, took with a, a drone over the lagoon. And he managed to splice it uh, with an aerial that was taken uh, during Operation Hailstone. So if you look to the right of the picture, you can see um, our liveaboard off to the side there. Um, and to your left, you can see what, what almost resembles an atomic um, explosion happening. Uh, this is uh, the Aikoku Maru, uh, one of the biggest vessels in Truck Lagoon, uh, getting a bomb into one of its holds, which was packed with explosives. Um, a, a very, very uh, impressive wreck. Uh, a passenger cargo vessel. Um, so basically, uh, if you if you imagine a shipwreck and uh, half of it is completely gone, as in totally eviscerated, and the other half is completely intact. Um, that's what happened with, in, in this explosion. Basically, 5,000 uh, tons of steel uh, turned into dust and the remaining part of the vessel went straight to 60 meters, along with a thousand people um, in the hold. That's another thing to remember about Truck Lagoon. Um, it has that human factor. You know, there was over 4,000 people that died uh, during this operation. Whereas, for example, um, Operation Crossroads, nuclear tests, um, they didn't have any humans on board. They had lots of animals, but, but no humans. Uh, fatalities during the tests, although there were some and after and still are today. Here's a fairly recent picture uh, we took of truck as well in the same area. You can see the oil leak there. I think that's coming from the Aikoku. Um, an interesting thing I want to mention um, that we just released last night uh, we released uh, a 3D interactive uh, map of Truck Lagoon. So one of the high school teachers in Savior High School in Truck is a programmer, and uh, he created this really uh, nice 3D map of Truck, which we integrated with all the wrecks and started uh, where we also could uh, put photos on each wreck. It's very clever. Um, if you go on our website and in our knowledge base, there is a direct link to it, and you can explore it. Uh, after the presentation. Uh, another great drone photo I just wanted to show off. It just uh, it just shows how awesome uh, Truck Lagoon is. You know, um, sometimes if you're in a vicinity, if you're on a wreck diving trip, uh, the distance you have to make from one wreck to the next can be quite significant. Uh, it can be an overnight steam uh, in, in many cases. Uh, in truck, there is no such thing. <laughs> it's quite a small lagoon and uh, sometimes the the turnover time from going from one wreck to the other is literally like five minutes or less um craig can testify to that you know i think the the longest kind of steam we're doing um would be like 35 45 minutes 
it doesn't really get longer than that. So, uh, like I said, you have a the biggest uh, concentration of war wrecks uh, on the planet in a in a in a in a small uh, small lagoon. So, so a lot of variety, uh, a lot of wrecks um, to explore. This photo that I uh, wanted to show um, is of Etten Island. Uh, it looks a bit different than all the other islands um, uh, because they look, you know, they have these, these big dunes, big mountains, look like Jurassic Park. This one is completely like a pancake and uh, it looks pretty obvious and it probably is. Uh, there was an airport uh, built on, on Etten Island. Um, very interesting. They basically knocked the whole mountain there uh, flat and, and, and created an air base. Um, which is very uh, visible still even today, where the coconuts have grown through the cracks of the concrete. It's, a, it's an island we actually visit uh, during an expedition, and uh, we can meet the locals there, uh, see the Air Force Base and, and other things. Um, on this slide, we have uh, Richard Longren from, from uh, GUE. He was with us on an expedition. And uh, I think I filmed him just speaking a few words about how the diving uh, in truck is. So let's see if it plays. My home turf is the Baltic Sea, where we have to be challenged with very cold water, usually limited visibility and so on. Here in Truck Lagoon, it's quite the opposite. If you would like to prefer, you could call it bathtub water. It's hot and warm, very nice, and almost unlimited visibility. And to make it even better, rarely any current at all. It's heaven on earth for diving. So it's a, a great uh, <laughs> endorsement from, from Richard Lundgren there. Um, but basically, in an effect, uh, Truck Lagoon for me represents uh, accessible and diverse um, wreck diving. Um, I know the pictures I've been showing you uh, have a lot of like, people in twin sets with, with uh, deco cylinders and rebreathers. But uh, to tell you the truth, you could have an open water license and have a fantastic uh, journey in truck. And one of the examples I can show you of that would be to take you on a little virtual dive, so to speak, of one of my favorite <laughs> wrecks. If you ever do a trip with me, you'll You'll get very tired of the word favorite because I use it like 15 times a day. <laughs> but that's simply because the there are just so many incredible wrecks uh, in truck. But yeah, Nippo is definitely uh, in my top three uh, of the 50, I think. And there are many reasons for that. Um, it is very diverse and accessible to a, to a large variety of divers. If we have a look at the slide here, uh, the top of the bridge uh, is at 24 meters so anybody with an advanced open water certification and beyond uh, can have a fantastic time uh, on this wreck uh, it goes down to 47 meters in the seabed so you know if you have a tdi extended range uh, certification again you can explore this wreck to the fullest but let me assure you if you have a 40 40 meter certification um, there is uh, you you can see uh, eighty percent of the wreck just just fine. Uh, but just to give you an overview of how easy the wreck diving in Truck Lagoon is compared to something like Bikini Atoll, let's look at the vessel itself. So you have a merchant vessel. Um, the the biggest advantage of a merchant vessel diving it uh, compared to a navy vessel is that a merchant vessel has a lot of open holds. So on on the Nippo here, for example, uh, I believe we have five holds on it okay and these are giant open uh, holds where you can go in and explore with lots of natural light so it's not like you need an advanced wreck diving certificate and the rest of it to to enjoy the nipple to the full it's like it couldn't be further from the truth and the same goes with the superstructure you know lots of open space lots of natural light very easy uh, diving to do. Another thing about the Nippo that makes it very easy to navigate is that it's sitting upright, okay, with a slight list to port, but but uh, nothing to cry home about. So another thing that's great about the Nippo is it's just so full of points of interests. Um, 
which we'll go through once I start showing the, the rest of the pictures. Uh, but again, you know, if you look at this drone shot of the of truck, you can see the the truck master or boat is uh, moored off on the nipple there. So to be honest, it's not the worst worst view <laughs> to, to start your virtual dive there to jump off the back of the boat. Fantastic place. Um, once you get down, the bow greets you. Um, and once you start swimming across the bow, you just see these gigantic holes open up. Um, the visibility is usually fantastic in a place like this. You know, warm water. I mean, to be honest with you, again, you see a lot of dry suits in my photos. Um, I'll tell you uh, if you want to know the reasons why I do that, but it's certainly not for uh, thermal exposure. You could be in a three millimeter wetsuit and you'd be just fine. Um, so warm water, plenty of visibility. Uh, usually there's no current on this wreck unless you come on a bad day. Um, and once you step into the holes, there's just, you know, uh, mountains of stuff to explore. And I think, I mean, compared to other uh, popular wreck destinations, maybe Scapa Flow, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has been retrieved or taken from there uh, in truck. Uh, it's it's very different. All the portholes are in place. I mean, you would you see things on wrecks and truck you would you would never see in Scapa, for example. It would just not be possible. Um, but I mean, he's jumping into the first hole there, and there's you know lots of gas masks greeting him. Uh, on the bottom of the four, you have range finders, you have bombs, you have guns, you have you know you swim further across the deck. There's a tank, Type One Ninety Five Hago tank greeting you. You know. Uh, can you believe there's three people can fit into that thing? <laughs> uh, you know, you go into the other holes, there's a bottle of, you know, hundreds of bottle, sake bottles. Um, one of my theories, how the Japanese lost this battle is they were like persistently drunk. Uh, and when you go through all these merchant vessels, there's just boxes and boxes of beer and hard liquor. So uh, I bet they were a bit buzzed when the actual uh, attack happened. Um, here's a picture uh, of a diver descending into the engine room uh, of the Nippo Maru. So again, you know, do you need a bit of uh, experience penetrating wrecks to, to do this part of the dive? Sure. Uh, but again, you know, with our guides, uh, it, you know, it's something we do on a daily basis. And there is actually a huge uh, bomb hole. I think I have it here on the, on the bottom of the wreck. This is this this bomb hole um, is widely believed to be the first damage to the ship to a ship in Operation Hailstone. Nippo Maru is believed to be the first ship that sunk. So that is obviously a huge light source uh, in the lower engine room, uh, and 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 very cool. But in the lower engine room itself, you know, you have these incredible uh, consoles and uh, well, just everything that is in a normal engine room. But it's just so well preserved. And there are some incredible uh, photography op opportunities. Um, here's the ship's clock in the engine room, you know, given the time of when Operation Hailstone started, quite fascinating. Um, you know, and now you, you swim outside of, of, of the hole in the engine room, you come back up on the deck on the other side of the wreck on the stern side. And, you know, you have these AA guns greeting you. You have, I mean, there's just stuff everywhere to explore. Uh, and then obviously you have the, the bridge itself, um, which is just fascinating. Um, so many things to see in there. So many good photographs uh, to see in truck. That, that, that was kind of um, the Nippo for me. Um, but if we look at this slide, I mean, it's just a representation. Are there any more, any challenging wrecks in, in truck? Absolutely. Uh, this is a line uh, that's being made for the engine room of the Aikoku Maru. And uh, the exception is more than the rule. We don't, we don't do that dive. And there's very few people that can do that dive safely. So it's one of those things where uh, we look at the conditions, we look at the skills of the diver before we conduct it. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite deep as well. Uh, so there, there are definitely challenging uh, wrecks in truck. Uh, not to say, but that's more the exception than the rule, uh, to be honest with you. Most of them are like the Nippo, uh, very, very easy, very accessible, not intimidating, just warm water and uh, pure 
diving uh, enjoyment where you just have sites like this. You know, I, I have a big fetish for <laughs> for engine rooms. That's maybe why I stayed so long in truck and did just like four hours in the water every day for a year and a half. Uh, just spectacular stuff, you know. Uh, very, very cool. So if we look at the skill level uh, needed, so the minimum uh, certification needed for for a truck is an open water diver. And we actually do recreational charters to truck. We have Andy Torbitz. I don't know if you know, well, I'm sure some of you know him. He's a quite famous guy in the UK, I believe. He was a stuntman on the new James Bond. He's, he's a special guest for us in Truck Lagoon in, in January next year uh, for our recreational trip. Uh, I think actually we have a few spots left in that one. Um, but anyway, open water is, um, is plenty to enjoy truck. And uh, I just want to drive that point home on the, on the next slide. So if you look at this slide, uh, this is a representation of maybe half of the wrecks or something, like the most popular ones. And you can see um, the green and the orange represents zero to uh, 40 meters. So as you can see here, the vast majority uh, is something that you can dive with an advanced open water certification. Uh, there's only a few wrecks um, that will require uh, technical diving uh, certifications. That's not to say there are not some amazing wrecks uh, down deep as well. I mean, we have the million dollar wreck, San Francisco, uh, Maru. We obviously have the Ikoku and uh, the Oite, tons of others. Um, so yeah, the, what I can say is I wouldn't let your certification hinder you from going. I wouldn't be in the thought mindset of saying, I'm going to wait three years to go so I can get my tech stuff and do everything. I wouldn't do that personally. I would go there as a recreational diver if I was that right now or as soon as I can and enjoy truck recreationally because it is literally impossible to enjoy this destination to the fullest in one trip. And the price point, uh, it, it, it allows you to return, uh, especially if you're just doing a week and you go and come back to another week. Uh, it's, it's, uh, as a techie, it's not, not, a, not a problem at all. But if you get to the money uh, matters, um, if, it, if you're doing a, a week or 10 day charter, the price is somewhere between three and 5,000 US uh, for, for the itinerary. You should uh, count on adding another 1,500 or to $2,000 is more likely for like marine park fees and your flight. And, you know, your beer tap or <laughs> Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the, the amount of money you should expect to, to be spending. If we talk travel, um, there's usually around 30 to 40 hour travel time from, from most major hubs. Um, so you guys are from the UK. Uh, you could either uh, fly to the States and jump on the island hopper, go to Hawaii and hop all the way to, to truck. Or uh, if you're flying east, you could go you know, to Japan, to Korea, to Philippines, but all of either way you go, you're gonna be going to Guam as the end destination before jumping on the island hopper uh, for your last stop to truck. Um, there are loads of tips and tricks how to do this correctly. Uh, I've taught people to get their flights for free. I do it quite often. Um, United is one of those airlines that releases credit cards where with your spending, you get miles, you know? So if you can get a United credit card, you can and you spend $3,000 with it. You know, for example, putting a deposit on your trip, uh, the miles and rewards you get actually uh, can pay for a return ticket to truck. So that can actually save you $1,500. Uh, something to think about. I'm also like an expert in, in getting people up to 100 kilos of luggage uh, for free. Uh, these are usually the mo biggest hurdles people face, uh, how to re reduce flight price and reduce uh, paying excess baggage fees. That's something uh, we have a lot of 
information about that on our blog, on our website, and in our knowledge base for you guys, should you be interested. So to summarize, um, Truck Lagoon is, the history is about warfare. This happened during World War II uh, with the allied forces uh, making their way to Japan and it had 4,500 people killed in conflict. Nine out of 10 of the vessels in the lagoon are merchant vessels. The depth is 25 to 35 meters on average. Uh, the skill level needed, open water, the cost three to 5,000 for the trip. And the travel time is usually 35 to 40 hours on average. So uh, to conclude about Truck Lagoon, I'm just gonna show a little video uh, quite an old one uh, from our trip there in 2018, I think. Um, <laughs> it's like two minutes or whatever. And then I think it might be reasonable to have a little break and well, and let you guys ask questions about truck and then we can move on to bikini. So I'm just going to put this movie on and then I'll stop screen sharing afterwards. wrecks are as good as everyone says they are extremely well preserved and the number of artifacts on each wreck is just mind-blowing a friend of mine once described it he said if Disney did wrecks Disney had made a blockbuster here it's fantastic me I wasn't actually thinking about all the marine life that goes around the wrecks. It's really difficult to pick a favorite wreck here. There are so many and they all have many great features that, that stand out. Once we exit the water, we are immediately handed our gear off, we are helped out of the water, and we are right away given a cold juice of some sort, which is so nice. Basically, there's no other place like it. Uh, the wrecks we've got here, the variety of the wrecks, uh, there's nowhere else in the world uh, what was this. My favorite trek is the Aikoku Maru. Imagine the sheer size of this ship at a depth which is not uh, attainable for recreational divers. The possibility of us diving it on this trip for such a long bottom time with all the logistics we had makes it uh, very special. Most of the operations in truck don't go to certain wrecks and these are these hidden gems in the lagoon that are very rarely visited. We came up with a unique uh, itinerary which we decided we wanted to show my, my dearest friends. Uh, it only started as a trip for, for close friends to come and join on uh, but it's now turned into a fully fledged uh, concept. Nowhere else can you get so close to history and get such a real feel for history as when you're diving the, the wrecks in Truck Lagoon.
invite you to come and, and join us on these uh, unique rack itineraries. Okay, um, here's our calendar. It's something I can, I can, uh, you can find on our website as well. But let me try and get out of this so we can start the questions. Is that, is that stop sharing now? Great. Um, I, I don't know how you, you guys want to do this. Um, what do you, what do you think? Pierce, you, you, you're running this, right? Do you want to, or, or Rob, you're running this. Do you want to, do you want to run a question round? Um, yeah. I mean, basically if, if anyone's got any questions, do unmute yourself and um, shout up. Um, personally, I've, I've been to Trump myself um back in 2018 and it is absolutely amazing yeah. and there is the amount of life there just amazed me the amount of life on all the wrecks yeah. and you know some of the wrecks at shallow depths are absolutely phenomenal the the life the anemones and the fish life over them just looks absolutely amazing um, it's, it's an often overseen fact and it's very good that you mentioned this that the marine life is amazing you shinkoku the oil tanker it's often considered to be one of the best wreck dives on the planet. Uh, it's overrun by coral and soft coral. Is, is that the one that comes virtually up to the surface? It's only a bit no, no, it's uh, the Fujikawa. There's like this huge ah, oil, yeah. oil tanker. Yeah. Uh, it's quite shallow as well, uh, with a bridge coming at around 15 meters. But uh, like there is just so much coral and sharks and turtles. And you know, I'm not really a a marine life guy like not not as much as i used to be uh i'm, I'm here for the rust uh, but you can't ignore uh the the uh, how much fantastic marine life there is there as well no precisely i mean that's it i was you know, i was going to see the wrecks and the history and then everything yeah. else but you know that side of it just blew me away and it, it's yeah you you mentioned about the dry suits people wearing dry suits over there i didn't i dived in a, a, a yeah. wetsuit and i got very warm in the wetsuit so do you want to just fill in a little bit why yeah. people do drive in dive in dry suits yeah so people make make a lot of fun of me for that um but uh they, they, i don't think anybody has has been in truck for an extended period of time and uh, if you spend a lot of time in truck uh and you're diving a lot every day well, one thing's going to happen, especially if you're in a wetsuit, and it might happen to you on a 10-day charter as well. Your skin's going to start to get mushy, and you're uh, going to be diving around a lot of sharp, rusty metal, which can give you some nasty infections and cuts and bruises. Um, that, so that's not very nice. Uh, on top of that, you have you know one wreck, maybe two, that have some of the aviation fuel that can burn you. That's not very nice either. Um, and on top of that, you know, secondary buoyancy device, uh, like my trim, like I'm so much more comfortable uh, diving a rebreather in a dry suit. That's like my main motivator on top of that. Yeah, a lot it's of people just... would refer to the truck trim, didn't they? The, yeah. the guys in the wetsuit, yeah, the truck absolutely. trim. So yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just find like, it, for me, it's just so much more comfortable uh, to dive a dry suit that way. But it's also because of, the cuts and bruises, the infections, which are can get quite bad in truck, um, and the aviation fuel and the rest of it. So I actually also wear gloves where the tips are cut off and uh, a three millimeter hood. And it's not for thermal protection uh, in the short run. Uh, it's for protection against the elements. Uh, but I will say um, it is very common that people that uh, dive uh, in the wetsuits they came with they're getting chilly on the last days. You have to remember your body's being submerged for, you know, four hours a day. Your body core temperature is going to start dropping ever so slightly and people start getting chillier a bit easier towards the end of the trip. I mean, it's nothing you won't survive, but that's another reason for me, if I was constantly back to back on trips, uh, the, the dry suit would make that annoyance um, a lot easier as well. So that's, that's why you should dry suit. Yeah. Any any other questions? So how many people that are traveling do about jet lag? Do you have days before and after? That's an excellent question. Um, so on the on the trips that we offer, uh, we we uh, create like a, a group chat. You know, people are in this software that we have where they can have a 
a messenger style chat and a message board. And one of the things we bring up is, is jet lag. We, we give people a schedule, a custom schedule where they have an option to arrive a couple of days early. We tell them what hotel to go to uh, and get some rest. I recommend like minimum 24 hours before. Recommended 48 hours before to arrive. And especially if you're doing tech, uh, either way, actually. Um, the major, like the decompression sickness cases I have seen in truck, although there are very few considering the, the type of profiles you're diving, like constantly repetitive diving every day. Um, a lot of it had to do with people arriving just off the plane. I think it's a huge factor of getting skin bends. Um, is, is arriving in poor shape and on the first couple of days overdoing it and then get skin bent and then the rest of your trip is is shot so you know my opinion to avoid that completely arrive 24 hours before minimum get get a lot of water in you uh, a lot of sleep and just get ready because i mean it's a holiday but four hours a day in the water kicks your ass too i've done dives in the red sea where it's hard work yeah. Uh, doing repetitive dives so what, what's a typical day like what time do you start diving what what time would you end yeah it's a good question um so depending on if it's a technical or recreational itinerary it's all about around 7 7 a.m 6 45 kind of around that time um let's just assume it's a technical diving itinerary the first dive is around 8 30 i believe you know get out of the water by 10 30 or so uh have lunch and whatever and then the second dive is around 2, 2.30. So we have a rule on the technical itineraries. There's a minimum surface interval, and this is never broken. Minimum surface interval of four hours before your next dive. Um, and on the recreational ones, obviously you're doing four dives a day. That's a bit shorter. Uh, but then again, you're doing uh, no stop limits as well. But uh, on the technical side, you're doing you know, uh, two to two and a half hour run times especially if you're on a rebreather, right? So um, we can assume that you'd be starting and you'd be waking up having breakfast, you know, around seven-ish and you'd be finishing your diving day at around 4.30, 5 o'clock. So it's a full-on day. You mentioned about the um, um, infection and stuff, getting scratches and bits and pieces. One of the problems I had when I was out in truck was I, I managed to get an ear infection. Yes. Now, having someone, I've never had an ear infection in my life. Yeah, it's kind until of like I went to truck. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it, apparently that's a very common thing. Yeah, it, it's true. It's kind of like Mexico. Uh, I mean, you have this beautiful warm water. It looks very clean, but you have to remember what's beneath it, <laughs> polluting it. So. Um, I usually, I mean, if my, if I started getting ear infections, uh, I would have some ear beer with me. So, you know, I don't know what mix you guys make. I mean, there's alcohol, vinegar and water, a bit of olive oil in there, whatever, you know, put it in the ear before every dive. Uh, that, that would be a lifesaver in, in that kind of a scenario, I would, I would say. So always good to have a bit of ear beer at hand and just put it in as a prevention or cost. Prevention is better than cure, I guess. And said, having said that, we actually don't get as many as you think. We get a few, but it's it's not as bad as you would think. And so, maybe not as bad as Mexico. Yeah. So uh, you know, the, the few years I've been on the boat, if 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 we got one a trip, that we that would be a lot. I don't I don't even think we get one a trip. So, yeah. So, but as Aaron said, prevention is is good. Hood. If you if you're predisposed to ear issues, we're yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's another reason I was wearing a hood, actually. Yeah. On the trip I did, there was, there was about 50 of us, and I think there was two of us got infections. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's not yeah, it's not a massive problem, but it is something to be aware of. Um, should we move on to um, bikini and cover that? And then yeah, happy I'm sure trip. there'll be some more questions after, after that one. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me try this again. That working? I think so. Let me play. Okay, so um, let's talk about bikini atoll. Let's talk about Operation Crossroads. Let's talk about some of the most fantastic navy vessels on the planet, all in one lagoon. 
Um, I want to start this section of the presentation with another video. Uh, it's a video that I edited uh, with some historical footage uh, that got declassified. Um, and it starts with Oppenheimer uh, crying on, on film, you know, regretting the monster uh, that he has created. And uh, then there's some historical footage um, of the preparations of Operation Crossroads. And then in specific, uh, the Baker explosion is being detonated. And I mean, I don't know if you've seen pictures of or footage of this before, uh, but if you happen, have not, I can assure you, uh, your jaw is about to drop completely. So uh, without any further ado, en en enjoy. Few people cried, most people were silent. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. It's a front row seat at the bomb blast. Seconds to go, and... Run, fire. Okay, I get goosebumps every time I watch that. Uh, so, uh, Bikini Atoll and Operation Crossroads. Um, what can I not say about this place? I mean, one of the reasons I stayed on the boat so long in truck was that uh, they were preparing, um, the, the vessel was preparing to launch um, their Bikini Atoll program and season. And that's actually what happens now is that the truck master, the vessel that we use in Truck Lagoon, it is seasonal. So, you know, from uh, May to October, it's in Bikini. And from October to May, it's in Truck Lagoon. So um, this is back in, I don't know, 2017, when uh, it, we were preparing for the first uh, Bikini Atoll season, which was conducted in 2018. And I can tell you, um, it's something we all waited for for a very long time. Uh, this is something that a lot of divers uh, do at the end of their dive career. I literally had a customer uh, that asked me on the last dive, uh, does anybody want to buy a JJ? And straight after that last dive, he retired from diving permanently. It was his last thing he wanted to do. Um, and he was happy and that was it. He was done. Uh, and that's the kind of approach that people take uh, towards Bikini Atoll. And I can sympathize with that. I consider myself extremely fortunate uh, to be able to do that destination on a regular basis. Uh, not only is it extremely far away and hard to get to, uh, so scheduling wise, it's hard to do for the average family man. It's also uh, the price range is, is, is vast, vastly more expensive uh, than Truck Lagoon. But anyway, let's get back on track. Uh, talking about Operation Crossroads, uh, and how it compares to Operation Hailstone. Instead of warfare, we're talking about a nuclear test um, that was conducted. So this is after uh, World War II. Um, so when you win a world war, <laughs> uh, you can take other nations' navy. So that's kind of what the, 
the, the U.S. did. You know, they took one of the prized possessions uh, from from the Germans, took the Prince Eugen. Um, they took the Nagato uh, from the Imperial Japanese Navy. You know, their pride and joy had the biggest guns on a Navy vessel in the world at the time. So they took all these vessels, you know, from them in humiliation. And uh, then they're like, oh, what should we do with these nice vessels? I know, let's blow them to smithereens. Uh, because they had all these atomic weapons they just got. And they only had a chance to try it twice in Japan. So now they're like, we never got to find out how to use it uh, on Navy vessels. Uh, a fun fact uh, that not many people know is there were actual discussions uh, about Operation uh, Hailstone being conducted with, with a nuclear weapon. That was discussed. Obviously, history shows that we chose against that, um, and it was done later in Bikini, but uh, it was on the table um, at one point. So yeah, uh, in Operation Crossroads, they had an aerial test, so a bomb dropped from the sky, and an aquatic test, which was the first of its kind. So they basically put an atomic bomb um, 25 or 20 meters underwater and detonated it. And that is the iconic uh, photo you have in the background of this, this slide. So it, if we look at the target fleet uh, for Operation Crossroads, there was 95 uh, vessels. Um, but, and with a support fleet of 150 vessels and 42,000 staff, uh, which a lot of them got cancer afterwards. I remember being in Salt Lake City in the airport, grabbing a taxi uh, a few years ago. And uh, somehow the guy overheard us speaking about bikini and he said, oh, I was in Operation Crossroads. He's, I was, we were like, wow, that's fascinating. He's like, yeah, I got cancer now, you know? <laughs> Um, a lot of a lot of the the servicemen. I mean, that's why I say warfare in Operation Hailstone. People lost their lives at the actual event. Crossroads didn't have any casualties except for a couple of fishermen, I think, accidentally uh, at the event itself, and some pigs and chickens and whatever. Uh, but it did have a detrimental human factor on the people that were there uh, from the navy and also uh, the poor inhabitants. Obviously the people of Bikini were evacuated, but they were thrown on some, you know, another island um, in their country, which was not suitable for, for habitat. And they got a lot of radiation and their kids have cancer and the rest of it. So, you know, again, uh, a lot of sad stories come from, from both of these events. And that's a huge part of, when we do these trips, you know, of course, we're there to enjoy the diving, but we're also there to learn history and uh, appreciate what happened uh, during these events. And knowing this information will make us want to not to repeat the, the same mistakes as we did in the past. Uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, 20 vessels were destroyed during the, the, the test. And what remained today in the lagoon are 10 main wrecks. So that's only 20% compared to what is in truck. So that's a huge contrast already, the number of wrecks uh, compared to truck. And uh, I can tell you that nine out of 10, because there's exactly 10 wrecks in bikini, are Navy vessels. There's only one merchant vessel. If we look at uh, the travel, <laughs> it. <laughs> It takes around 40 hours plus to get to uh, Kwajalein and to Majuro, which is kind of the Marshall Islands is, is a neighbor to, to, the, to the FSM and Chuk. But then you have to account, once you get to Kwajalein, you get to this you know, secret uh, army base. They greet you with M16s, tell you to get in line, put you into a holding pen, check out your paperwork. And then they release you, of course, sort of. They take you into a taxi put you onto the pier, throw you onto this boat, and they never want to see you again. <laughs> uh, not, not the friendliest. Well, actually they are. Uh, but uh, they put you on the boat and off you go. 
to the neighboring uh, island of Ibai next to Kwajalein, and that's where the liveaboard vessel is. And that's where you embark. And you have a not, none less than a 30-hour steam from Ibai to Bikini. So going from 40 plus hours just to get to the country, we're actually talking about 70 hour plus in total. So the travel time compared to truck, even though they're fairly close to each other, is massive. Um, so it's not something, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to get time off work for, for truck, but it's a lot harder for, for bikini, especially because we have longer trips there as well. Oh. Um, so if we look at, Bikini Atoll uh, itself, there it is. Uh, as you can see by the, the scale below, it's not the largest lagoon either. Uh, but what makes it even more convenient is the target area is uh, much more concentrated than truck even. So it's literally like a couple of minute putt between <laughs> wrecks every day. Uh, same as uh, truck, but even easier. Um, so that is the least of our concerns when you're in bikini. Let's talk about the tests a little bit. So we have uh, Abel, AKA Gilda, was uh, test was conducted on June 30th, 1946. Uh, that was the aerial test I mentioned. Uh, the yield 23 kilotons or the equivalent of 23,000 tons of TNT, created a half a kilometer fireball, started fires three kilometers away and sank uh, five ships. So uh, he, the pilot actually missed the drop point by a couple of miles. Or something. Either way, it was a bit of a flop. The whole thing, when it was done, um, the generals watching were not impressed. Uh, you know, they had like 70% of the world's cinema equipment there. You know, journalists everywhere wanting to flex off the American Navy muscle right there. And uh, it was actually a huge failure. Um, but nothing could prepare them to what happened uh, with Baker, a.k.a. the Helen of Bikini, which was the second test conducted on July 24th, 1946. So it was the same yield, uh, but a bit different effect, as you can see. Uh, with a 5.5 Richter scale earthquake, um, a 30 meter tsunami, um, four meters of, uh, no, four million tons uh, of sea and sand evaporated and it sank almost a double amount of uh, ships. So as you can see, um, a lot more effective uh, overall. A little funny fact before we crack on, uh, I forgot to Google this man's name. I can never remember his name, but anyway, uh, I think it's this French designer, uh, you know, the guy that came up with the bikini garment that we all uh, no, today, the reason it's called Bikini uh, is because of Operation Crossroads. He watched the tests um, probably on his television and uh, he was very inspired uh, by what he saw and he wanted to create an explosive garment. And uh, that's what we have as uh, our bikinis uh, today. So a little fun fact there for you uh, about Bikini. Um, yeah. Here's one, one shot that we took um, of, of Nagato, the, the Japanese battleship. So these are the biggest, biggest guns on the battleship in the world at the time, 16-inch guns. Uh, you see how big they are compared to the uh, technical diver there. You know, he's at around 55, 60 meters, something like that. Uh, I think we did an hour bottom time to get this shot. But yeah, there's uh, some, some seriously seriously fun stuff to explore uh, in bikini if we look at this slide just a simplified uh, photo of the bikini wrecks so you can see the list of the wrecks in bikini one to nine you might notice that there should be 10 there but that's because there's only nine wrecks in bikini at all there are 10 wrecks from in bikini on our itinerary but that's because the 10th wreck is not in Bikini, it's in Kwajalein, where you start your journey. Uh, and you go and dive that wreck as well. And that's Prince Eugen. Uh, and Prince Eugen survived Operation Crossroads. They were going to tow it back, and then it sank uh, right outside of Kwajalein. So yeah, 
Uh, I wanted kind of to do a virtual dive on the bikini at all as well, uh, just to show you the contrast from of the Nippo Maru that we just watched. Uh, and I picked the aircraft carrier uh, because talk about black and white. <laughs> um, you know, like 50,000 tons instead of 5,000. Uh, and wow, look at this. Here's the schematics. Uh, the schematics we have on our website as well. It's a 20 megabyte PDF document, 20 pages. Uh, if you want to be a geek and explore them. But as you can see, looking at this slide, it is quite a big vessel with hundreds of compartments. Um, the, the best analogy I have for, for the Saratoga is it kind of reminds me of the zombie apocalypse. Uh, you know, when you go to the mall, like in a classic uh, zombie movie. So, you know, you get to the mall, it's all dark, there's shit everywhere. Uh, <laughs> you know, you go into a store and everything's been thrown everywhere. Uh, and there's multiple levels, hundreds of shops, uh, and the lights are turned off. Uh, that's kind of what uh, the Saratoga reminds me of. Uh, because you have this gigantic steel structure underwater that has these openings and once you go inside it is a maze and it's not to be taken lightly as well even though you know the the flight deck uh, is at an easy 20 plus meters um, the penetrations can go into the deep 40s around 50 and you can go very deep inside these wrecks so you know the, the more uh training you have cave diver advanced wreck diver the more experience you have in that kind of environment the better i can say um the, your the experience you can have on the saratoga it totally reflects your experience because we, we're not going to let you do a part of the saratoga if we don't think you you can do it safely uh that's completely up to you know, mine and Craig's discretion, uh, looking at your certification and your experience and how you are to dive with, because I'll be frank, you know, we put ourselves at risk when we take you guys in there. If you, uh, if, if, if somebody can't handle the mustard and, and they, they, they freak out or something, the amount of silt that's in the Saratoga, um, that's undisturbed and very fine. It can create some very interesting, um, scenarios. So you definitely need to know what you're doing. I, I don't want to scare you from the Saratoga. The, the, like 80% of the stuff you can do is perfectly fine. Um, you know, most divers would be fine to do all of that. And it's not intimidating at all. But it's that last part uh, where people, you know, they're there. They want to see everything. Um, but everybody needs to know where their, where their limits are for sure. Uh, I think with the Saratoga. Uh, so if we're talking about skill certifications, we don't take recreational divers to bikini. Uh, you need to be minimum, minimum extended range. So 50 meters, 55 meters on air, qualified um, using deco gases. Uh, although I would recommend normoxic trimix at the least on open circuit. And for rebreathers, you need to be mod two. Uh, you can't be doing these kind of depths on air inside a deep inside an aircraft carrier, not possible. Uh, let's do a bit of a photo slide around the Saratoga. Obviously, when you get down, you have these famous, uh, beautiful six-inch guns that greet you. Uh, once you get to the elevator shaft, I don't know how well it shows on your display screen, but there is a big uh, entrance there where the diver is. And then each arrow is showing an entry point for a penetration. So on top, you have the CIC, the Command Information Center. You have the dentist, where he's going, uh, operation rooms. Um, you have the scullery above him. You have blacksmith below him, uh, crew quarters to his left, dive lockers to his right, bombs at the bottom. I, there's just stuff everywhere. I mean, I'm just, I'm not even mentioning, like, half of the penetrations you can do there is so 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 much you can do uh, you could dive the saratoga for years and, and not see everything craig and i can both attest to that uh 
Mr. Diver going into towards the dentist, I think. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, permanent guidelines inside uh, some of the penetrations of the Saratoga, uh, but you, you have to bring your own lines with you because you will be using them. Yeah, that's when he's going into the sick bay. There are many, many doors. Some of them are still locked, much to my annoyance. <laughs> um, but yeah, you come into open doors and then you see stuff like this. You know, the dentist office is just spectacular. Um, it's so well preserved. I almost feel like I could sit down in that thing and have a root canal. <laughs> um, but you, you look at the bottom of this image. I mean, look at the silt. You need to be extremely careful when navigating it. Uh, it's hard to get a silt-free picture of it. Uh, and that's quite deep inside the wreck as well. This is inside the dive locker. Quite a hard place to navigate to as well, but the risk is the reward. This is kind of what you get greeted with, these old Navy helmets. Uh, they're quite famous uh, on the internet. They made their way all over. Big rep representation of the Saratoga. Uh, lots of bombs. Obviously, we have lots of planes. Um, unfortunately, a big part of the flight deck has collapsed. Um, the wreck's been there for over 70 years now. So a lot of these Hellcats are crushed, but you will find them. You just will, won't find them in the condition they were um, when it initially got sunk. And, uh, <laughs> and most... Most surprisingly, uh, I remember my first dive on the Saratoga. Um, it was it was about two and a half, three hour dive, lots of penetration. Uh, I remember coming out of that dive squealing in my rebreather. I was so happy. I couldn't believe uh, what I just experienced. I was just over the moon, swimming on the flight deck past the, the six inch guns. And then all of a sudden, a three meter, two, three meter tiger shark just kind of cruises by you and you're just like, oh my God, I don't know if this can get any better. Um, and it was, that that was my mindset until I got on the Digo bar <laughs> and the tiger shark was hanging around us for 90 minutes. <laughs> At that point, um, you get a bit annoyed. <laughs> um, there's a lot of juvenile tiger sharks in the lagoon. And they are curious to say the least. Um, so that's that's fun. That's uh, Antti, good friend. He's exiting the scullery of the Saratoga. So it's just, I mean, it's a fun image. It shows the silt and the penetration opportunities that you have in the destination. So you see he's like coming to an air funnel that goes into the scullery. The next picture that's inside the scullery, you know, you go in there and obviously you see the pottery and all that stuff is completely intact. Beautiful. Um, this, um, this small video that I filmed in bikini, I think in 2018, uh, just give you an idea of the, how to dive the Saratoga. experience in Bikini Atoll so far has been uh, absolutely off the charts. It is a kind of a lifelong dream to come to this part of the world uh, again. I was here in Truck Lagoon about 10 years ago and to revisit it now with some enhanced skill sets like the rebreather, it opens up a whole new world of opportunity. Uh, being able to explore these wrecks further than I, uh, than I thought I could in the past. Every time
time you stand after a long dive, long deco, the staff and crew meet you with a smile and lots of drinks and water. Fantastic experience. All right, so uh, it's a little video about bikini there. Um, so if we look at the travel, I mean, we kind of discussed this already, 70 hour plus, 60 to 70 hour plus in total. Flights, more or less the same price actually, maybe slightly more expensive reaching you know, around $2,000 if you book in advance. Um, but you know, the, the price of the ticket uh, is now somewhere between 8,000 and coming close to 10,000. So you add the flights on top, you're going to be spending at a minimum 10,000 in total to 12. So that's why I say like, um, this definitely is more of a trip of a lifetime because it's just harder to get to uh, and uh, more expensive. So it's not like you can just go into it twice, three times easy. Um, and but the thing about bikini, we offer different lengths. So we have 10 day trips, 11 and 13. Personally, I'm a big favorite of the 11 day itinerary. And that's uh, 13 can get a bit, bit too much, especially when there's only like 10 wrecks in the lagoon. Uh, I think 11 is a great, great uh, compromise. Also, like uh, 13 days is very exhausting uh, doing hardcore diving for all that time. So, yeah, it's just my opinion. Um, so to, to summarize, uh, bikini, uh, in history, it was a military test, no direct casualties, lots of indirect ones though. uh, nine out of 10 on Navy vessels. So the opposite of truck, the average depth is now between 40 and 50 meters. So technical diving certifications are required minimum extended range, normoxic trimix CCR. Uh, the price point is a lot higher, seven to 8,000 or more. Um, and the travel time, like I said, 70 plus hours. Uh, so here's our calendar for bikini. It runs to the end of the 2024 season. Um, we're actually sold out for, this is an old calendar. We're, 2022 is completely sold out. Uh, we're only selling 23 at the moment um, and onwards. Um, the, the combination uh, of, of backlogged trips. So people have had the, the trips last year postponed. Uh, all the people having to be moved, uh, plus the increased demand um, has led to a very big shortage of uh, availability uh, in bikini. Um, so much so that maybe we'll have a second boat there at, at some point, but that's not happening right now. Uh, so yeah, something I can recommend to read more about all the wrecks in truck and bikini is our website. So like I told you, we have a knowledge base. We have obviously uh, the blog, which is like once a week. It's like 60 entries in there from the last year. So, uh, and then we have the web page itself. And the, one of the things about uh, the truck and bikini when I did the research before going there first time, it was so hard to find a decent amount of information, like I'm not a database of, uh, of photos, information, PDFs, videos. I couldn't find it. And so I've spent around four years making this website and I keep piling information in there. So if you're really curious about the subject, uh, most likely I will have what you need in there. And if not, please contact me and I'll, I'll make sure I find and, and put it in there. We also have a big YouTube channel, plenty of videos from both destinations. Um, our content and photos are regularly published in, in magazines. Um, and I think I have a, one last clip of Richard left 15 seconds and I think we can start taking questions. Just a sec. Being part of a Dirty Dozen uh, expedition is quite unique. Uh, what it's all about is to gather uh, high capacity divers into one liveaboard and then to go out and simply explore our surroundings. 
and that makes the experience quite unique because uh, everyone on the boat is passionate about their diving they like challenges and they want to go and do extreme diving so of course that's very rare to find in this world many operations uh, depend on bringing as many people as possible on the liverboards and so on while this is quite a difference fewer numbers more capacity and much more cool and badass diving right a bit of a pr there from from richard but i think i can stop the sharing now is that did i stop the sharing yes so. yep that's all good so that uh, that concludes it for both destinations i hope it wasn't too long no, 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 that's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. It's, it looks absolutely amazing out in between some of those those wrecks. I mean, the aircraft carrier, you could probably, yeah, as you say, dive it for years and not see everything. It's just you dive it forever. It's, it's, it's one of the best wrecks I've ever dived in my life, if not, yeah. So get, um, things like gas and soften the lime and stuff like that, you know, truck master deal with all of that side of things. And that's, that's an additional cost onto things is or is that yeah so it, well in the dirty dozen program so if we would you know make a seahorse trip for example uh in the price that you would pay to us um the cylinder rentals would be included so if you had a twin set uh side mount uh ccr cylinders bailout cylinders deco cylinders that would all be included but the uh, consumables like helium uh o2 and soft lime is charged for additionally and at the end of a trip and i can tell you right now on a technical itinerary in truck i think you would get away with around maybe maybe a thousand dollars in truck maybe somewhere around the same you know in consumables so we're talking soft lime helium and o2 i think the main factor there driving the price up is is the the helium and that's because helium is like 23 cents or something it is incredibly expensive you know in the red sea it's six cents a liter yeah. just to give you a comparison um so it's like quadruple the price and that's because uh, moving these uh, supplies to the end of the planet end of the earth is, is no easy task and it's very expensive uh, yeah. Craig, wouldn't you agree that uh, helium is probably the main contributing factor on the onboard bill? Helium and sometimes soft alarm. Yeah. So the, the, the one thing the, the one thing Aaron didn't mention is traditionally we only offer helium to rebreathers, but we will offer to open circuit if they tell us in advance and we, we need months. It takes about three or four months to get the helium there. We cannot stock that much helium, but we will do, if you want, we can have an open circuit uh, gas bill three three hundred dollar dive all day long <laughs> uh, we had one guy uh, i won't name names but uh his his uh jj broke about oh. halfway through the trip his first dive was oh. his fill was was 497 dollars, and oh. still after over two years on the boat he's got the biggest gas bill at oh. somewhere just between three and a half and four thousand dollars just for gas and that was ha half a trip of open circuit Wow. Like every breath, it's just like ding, 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 ding. It literally really is. <laughs> Jesus. So, so we don't we don't offer it unless you let us know months in advance because it takes months to get it to e buy. So, I mean, yeah. not not to say that you shouldn't do it on open circuit, but like if if you're looking going towards the closed circuit route, I cannot emphasize enough how big of a difference it is in bikini. Like for obviously for the diving time, the bottom time, and the price. So you basically get a lot more time underwater on the bottom and you pay a lot less for it, which on a but, trip, on a, but, like, yeah, I mean, but it's not to say you couldn't I, do I it. I need to, on the side, we've had lots of people come open circuit. Uh, we have people who are not into penetration, have fantastic trips. Absolutely. Um, but it depends uh, on your expectations. You know, and like what I say, when you can do a return trip to truck in different configurations, I feel like the configuration you're going to take to bikini is going to be the one you were planning to have at the end. It does that make sense? Like if you're completely fine with open circuit until, you know, the di end of your diving days, then do it, you know. But if you were yeah. planning the CCR, I would definitely like try and, get, try and get it first. That's my point. Aaron's a bit of a CCR snob, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a few of us on there anyway, so. <laughs> well, we, we, we have some incredibly experienced people have come 
people you would know by name possibly that are on open circuit and, and do just fine. They just have shorter dives and, you know, they, and they've done it on air. And I'm not recommending all the dives on air, but the flight deck on the Saratoga is 30, 31 meters. The top of the superstructure is at low tide is about 15. You can spend hours between 15 and 30 meters and see tons of stuff. If you yeah. want to go see planes on the sand, you're at 50 meters. If you want to see the props, you're at 52 meters. But, but still, you know, there's stuff. There's, you know, it's not, it's not like, like truck where you can be at nine meters on the side of the, or the 12 meters on the side of the high end. You know, the the shallowest thing in bikini is the is the superstructure on the, on the Saratoga. Everything else is past 30, 30 high 30s. So except for the props on the Nagato, they're in the high 20s. And those are amazing. Four massive props at 26, 27 meters, starting at 26, 27 meters. Is there anything else in bikini other than the diving? Or, you know, because if you're um, there for ro rows of coconut, rows of coconut trees. That's it. <laughs> but, you know, the, the amazing thing is people will get on the boat. I'll do the briefing on the way there on the crossing and they're all gun ho. And I say, OK, we have we have uh, uh, we do in an 11 day trip, you do 15 dives. Oh, I can do more. And, and by, you know, halfway through the trip, mid trip, we do half a day dive and go to the island, have a barbecue. Give, if I can, I'll give you a tour of, of, of the facilities because people used to live there. Actually, there are there's a, a, about seven people who live there. And, and by that point, people are like, oh, I'm going to skip that and go diving. Like, no, you're not. No, you're not. And then by then, like, yes, I am. You know, it's, it's exhausting. It's, it's, it's really, really exhausting, as Aaron mentioned. You know, it's people, people are traveling for, for days and then at sea for a full 24 to 30 hours. And then you get there and you're all, yay. And, you're in it, and it, it's deceiving because it's warm and it's beautiful, but you're still at, you know, 40 to 50 meters. And people get a little deceived by it, so. So, yeah. The coconuts glow in the dark. Um, <laughs> I, I offer. I actually have on many of the beach trips, many of the trips. I say, "Who wants a hot coconut?" And about two thirds of people will have one. Um, I've had a few. I'm. I don't know if I'm glowing. But <laughs> not. Not yet. I wouldn't recommend it though. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. Th th there's actually when they when they return the people that I think the recommendation was seven a month was that was safe. And then I think they revived that to four or five. I've had two in, in two years. So I think, I think I'm well within my- uh, Yeah, you're good. You, you've been but, to Chernobyl. So you probably got worse than my one, one or two. Well, but, but that's the thing. I mean, uh, oh, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but like Dirty Dozen offers trips to Chernobyl and it seems a bit weird for a for an expedition diving company to offer a land-based trip like that. But uh, it's kind of a, a, of a side mission for people that have done bikini because a lot of the people that do bikini including myself have always had a fascination with you know the wasteland the fallout uh kind of since they were kids i know i have so uh you know uh going to chernobyl was equally an amazing experience for me as going to uh bikini uh even though it was topside i mean when you're in control room number four of uh in inside chernobyl nuclear power plant I can tell you, your heart rate, heartbeat's going a little bit higher than usual. It is, is, it's crazy stuff. But like um, our guide there, um, they are professional dissymmetrists by, by trade. They've been there in the exclusion zone for 12 years. And the amount of information that they push into your head about the effects of radiation, how it all works, and this and that and the other, uh, it makes you think twice about the stuff that you've done in bikini. <laughs> so, in, in bikini, do you have any? Do you have to watch any of that? Do you, you know, is is it? Do you have to have any dosimeters on the boat, or you know? I, no, but uh, they're, they're like in the light of doing Chernobyl uh, and learning things and doing a bit more research, which is all on the website in the knowledge base. By the way, there are certainly places uh, in bikini atoll I would not walk to. You know, the, the center of the island is red hot. Um, but the coast where you have your barbecue, for example, that's safe as, as anything. You know. the, the, highest, the highest recordings in, in the whole atoll or in the west, northwest corner where they did the Castle Bravo test in 1956, I think. Uh, that was the biggest nuclear test the US ever did. Uh, first thermonuclear test. And there's, I mean, if you look at Google Earth, you can see the crater, it vaporized two, two islands, I believe. Yeah. 
that that still has quite high readings. We don't go there. Um, I have been in the center of Bikini Island once, but just briefly. It's more in the ground. We've had a number of people with dosimeters and, and the readings are, one guy brought, he, he tested in his apartment in, in New York and it was higher in his apartment in New York than it was in the, in the little old yeah. bar where we also have our barbecues. Yeah. So, so it's uh, people, I know there's a guy who's lived there on and off for three years. He's, uh, he's kind of the mechanic. There's a pig who's probably highly radioactive. She eats coconut husks and yeah. it's the stuff, it's the stuff that's grown that's deemed as, as unsafe. Don't, don't eat anything. Yeah. hence the coconuts so. i think that that's what people forget you know a lot about the radiation it's it's not like uh you're walking through a fog of radiation the the radiation is often in the ground and and when you're stirring up sand in the middle of, of bikini island you're stirring up stuff that's been that is highly radioactive so again you know people not washing their shoes afterwards i mean it's all these kind of small things that you would forget that's the that's the ones that matter uh, at the at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of stuff I picked up from Chernobyl. Definitely, uh, when I go on my next bikini trip, I'm gonna write uh, some of my thoughts and precautions down on a piece of paper and just give it to people, and they can decide what they want to do. Uh, they've signed the liability there's, release; it's up to them. <laughs> you do, yeah, have you done anyone done any tests to see whether there's any radiation actually on the wrecks? There has been very minor stuff. It's more been land based. There is there is a theory that. Or, or there are thoughts, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, I don't have enough knowledge right now, but that it's not so bad. I, in all my briefings, I say, please don't stir up the, the silt. We have no idea. Please don't remove stuff. Please don't be. The silt is like talcum powder. You yeah. can, you can, uh, you everything. can, but you can, I, I'm more worried about the oil. There's, there's a, a heavy engine yeah. oil in lots of the ceilings. So that's what people get up, you know, especially rebreathers, they'll sit close to the ceiling and then it, it's like a lava lamp that comes down and just bombards you. So, um, but the, the fish and the crustaceans are deemed safe to eat in the, in the lagoon. Um, so I, 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 it's interesting so. you mentioned that because um, I had my guide from Chernobyl uh, in my apartment. We had an expedition to Chernobyl maybe a month ago and uh, I showed him this. So this is the permanent guideline from uh, Bikini. We had to cut this section for whatever reason and replace it. Uh, and I just kept it as a souvenir, you know, uh, because I, I don't pilfer. I don't take any any other things that that are uh, that are there. But but this was something that was being thrown in the, in the trash. So I decided, OK, that's my little memento that I have for myself of uh, of Bikini. And he took out his professional decimeter and did a very thorough check on this. And there was nothing uh to worry about for 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 me uh, uh water and radiation are not really friends in that aspect you know there was a study done two years ago i think it was oxford university but i'm not positive could have been combined with another university and they deemed parts of of the islands in bikini as the most radioactive places on the planet yeah it's a little hard to 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 for me to believe that, because if you go uh, a number of miles to the to the west and we talk, there is actually a nuclear. Uh, there's a dome that's full of nuclear waste from the blast. So uh, I, I don't know how they did this, and I, I'm sure there's parts of Chernobyl that are far more radioactive. Fukushima is far more radioactive places. But, uh, but I think it makes a great headline in the newspapers, right? Yeah. And, and and that's the thing here is is when people think about radiation, they think about it as uh, an invisible forest fire. It's, it's kind of the best analogy I have because um, if you're walking in a forest fire, you have no idea, invisible one, when when you get burnt. And that's why you have a, uh, with, with radiation, you have a, a, a decimeter. And it's something I notice quite often in Chernobyl um, when I'm walking around the exclusion zone in Pripyat uh, and in the power plant itself, I make it a very big point to walk exactly in the footsteps of the guide and the people that are leading it. And it's, it's so important because, I mean, it, there's a perfect example on the square in Pripyat. There's like this, I don't know what it's called in English, like the cover for the sewer. There's like Man, one of them. Yeah. yeah, there's one of them like in the center square of Pripyat. Uh, and it's a very interesting example. Like you walk up to it, you have a decimeter, everything's fine. And then you just put your hand, like you start getting closer and closer to it. And the decimeter just goes apeshit. It almost explodes. Um, 
and that's a perfect example uh, and we would be there i remember last summer and uh, there was plenty of people around you know this was a time when the hbo series came out there's a lot of tourists uh, <laughs> and i saw like five people after we left stand on top of that thing you know on their cell phones and you're just like Jeez. holy shit <laughs> so you know you have to really uh that's the thing you know the, the 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 more you know the more prepared you are to be in this kind of environment uh, the danger will reflect that if you're ready and you do the right precautions uh, and you're careful uh like when we finish a trip the the equivalent radiation we've had is uh the same as going from uh london to new york on an airplane i think uh, the last time around last month it was the equivalent of a CT scan, but that was because I was in control room four uh, of the nuclear power plant where it actually, the whole thing went wrong. I was under the, the new safe confinement. So yeah, I, I was expecting that. And it's not something I'm going to do every day, but neither you do with a CT scan. Right? So yeah. In, in almost three years, I've been there 29 times, I think, on Bikini Island, 27 or 29 times. So far... I'm still breathing. <laughs> I, I don't, my hair is still, I still have my hair. There's no lesions. So yeah, I've been there quite a lot. So, but, but like I said, we, we spend half a day on the island. Uh, on the boat, there's zero risk. So, I mean, if you have any concerns, don't go on the island. But, you know, maybe in five years, I'll regret it. But I did go to Bikini 30 or 40 times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly so Aaron just to finish up um the all the information people can get from your web website I put a link in the chat for if anyone um wants to go and have a look at that there is loads of stuff on there I did have a look um during the week when I knew Aaron was coming on to talk to us to see what was on there there's tons to read and information about all the places that that he doesn't head off to and some interesting reads on all of it so please do head across there and have a look um i'm gonna kill the recording there and um leave that there for for there but please do feel free for everyone's chat if you do have any more questions if aaron's got time yeah i'm here i got i got time i want to add one thing before aaron came on you guys were talking about uh transporting your breathers and what kind of boxes etc yeah a couple a couple of points that I, I want to add but i hadn't got into yet was we have had a uh, Comparatively, uh, relatively not that many uh, bags go missing. The worst is bikini because if it doesn't, if you come the day before, there's not a flight for two days, and we're not going to wait for one one bag. Yeah. That's uh, true. In, in in Chuk, we can go back to shore and get your stuff. Also, as as Aaron mentioned, because it's such a stress on people that they don't realize flying all that time, going to sea, especially if it's rough for that 24 hours. And they jump in the water. We do one dive on the Prince Eugen or two, and then we go off. It's really a good idea to get there so that you have a cycle of, you got to look at the flights, if a next flight's going to come before the boat leaves. So that's a good thing to remember. So if you arrive today, we'll dive tomorrow, we'll leave tomorrow afternoon. So you kind of, you kind of figure that out. Uh, as for packing it, I've seen everything. Pelican boxes, uh, uh, rolling boxes from the hardware store, uh, that the key thing is if you're coming on American, if you're coming through Guam as opposed to uh, Manila, which you don't have to go through Guam, but then you're on a different schedule, it's going to get TSA is going to rip it open and make a mess. And, and I've seen people lose it because it's all upside down. Separating the head, you know, some people carry the head on board. There's, there's nothing you can do. They're going to rip it open no matter how many things you put on it. So just pack it as best you can in a hard plastic box. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great point you bring up there. Um, I think in the in the knowledge base on the website we have a, a TSA document uh, that you can print out and put into your luggage. Not that the TSA always reads and they follows it, but it's <laughs> but care. it's but like 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 you mentioned, Craig. I mean, I think it's like personally, I have a a, a Pelican case that that has the dimensions to go on the airplane. You know, if you have certain dimensions, they're safe for that. And I pack my rebreather head, uh, most of the rebreather in there actually, uh, and just the dry suit and the regs and whatever in the in the check-in. And that's always worked well for me. At least if TSA is going to have a field day, they can have it with me watching them. Um, so that that usually 
that calms my nerves a bit, to be honest. Yeah. We, we have enough stuff, uh, about six full tech sets, uh, but it's open circuit. So, you know. Um, and that's maybe just, another, just, yeah. Uh, uh, another thing that came up, you know, uh, there was a guy that was going on a bikini charter uh, that was not Dirty Dozen, but he reached out to me beforehand because he saw the website and then asked for some questions and information. And I gave him a couple of tips on packing, especially to get there a bit early and, uh, you know, to put massive stickers, KWA, the airport, airport code on the luggage itself, uh, because the, the ground staff is landing on six different islands. So the, the, the plane is packed with luggage for different stuff, you know, so when they're quickly unloading it, it's very easy to miss a bag. And if you miss a bag and you arrive the same day, it's not coming with you to Bikini. So on his group, he, it didn't happen to him, but half the boat, six people, missed mm. their luggage and their rebreathers, and they were on open circuit the whole trip. They were furious. Is that the young American guys? Uh, Correct. Well, this, this guy is a young American. I don't know the group, but oh, they, I yeah, know it was only, they were yeah, traumatized. It, tur it turned out it was, it was yeah, Grant. He, yeah, he Grant, actually, yeah, yeah. He had his uh, his uh, sidewinder. He he had that, but all the side like the side mount kit he didn't have. The other guys were all open circuit anyway. So I just gave him my side mount stuff, and then we worked it out. But but, but you can people... imagine like prevention is cure on this one. And when it happens, I mean, on on our first trip in 2018, my my rebreather didn't show up, and I had to wait three days or two days. But at least I I arrived three days early, so it was fine. Um, I, I, I didn't have to go without any equipment. Scary wait, seeing if it turns up. <laughs> I mean, imagine spending all that money, get time off, and then some luggage handler messes it all up. I mean, it's it's definitely something I highly encourage people to do. And obviously, it's your own responsibility and choice, but don't say we didn't tell you. <laughs> I think in two full seasons of Bikini, there's been three people that have had to switch to open circuit. Yeah. So that's it. Three and two seasons. So it's not it's not that prevalent, but also some people have come early and their their bags arrived before they got on the boat. So you're spending all that money, spend a little extra, you know, a few extra nights in the beautiful the hotel beautiful e hotel e buy with all the yeah. entertainment of a white wall. <laughs> <laughs> bring some bring some books and some beers or something because you're going to be bored but uh yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, we're all, all used to sitting in isolation now anyway yeah, so. oh yeah it's just like a quarantine <laughs> who cares <laughs> but but e-buy is safer than chook than weno walking around e-buy at night is better than walking around weno at night so oh, that, that is true so, so you're okay e-buy is okay it's okay all right excellent thanks very much guys i'm going to stop the recording there and okay. um, let's hit that